بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه لا يدون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين وشفيل المظنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد والأهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أضحب الله عنهم الرجس وطحرهم تطحيرا واللان استدامة الباقي لعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فأطال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة صلوات من أكبر Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Shura in ayat number 23 gives the command to the Prophet that O Muhammad say to your people that I do not ask for any compensation or wage in return for the hard work that I have done in bringing the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you illa al-mawaddata fil qurba except to love my family that is the essential meaning of the word al-qurba and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains further by saying وَمَنْ يَقْتَرِفْ حَسَنَةً and whoever acquires goodness this hasana refers to the mawadda of ahlul bayt نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا حُسْنَ Allah says whoever acquires this love for ahlul bayt we will increase in its goodness in the husn of that, in Allah ghafoorun shakoor, Allah is indeed, you know, what, what is the implication of that law and muwadda of Ahlul Bayt? Allah says He is forgiving and shakoor, He is thankful. He is thanking the ummah for loving the family of Rasulullah because the essential message was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet. If somebody was supposed to give any compensation to Rasul, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah says, I would like you on my behalf to give compensation to the Rasul in form of the love for his family. Salawat. And this mawadda or muhabba, or the love and devotion that, they have, that we have towards the Ahlul Bayt, this is expressed in two different ways. By celebrating the events which are related to them and by commemorating the tragedies which are related to the history of the Ahlul Bayt. In the month of Muharram and Safar, we were busy with commemoration of the events regarding the tragedy of Karbala and what happened after it. And in that sense, this is in a way conclusion of that, you know, series of the um, majalis and the mourning period that we had. And inshallah, tomorrow night we will be ha having a celebration of what is known as Eid Zahra. Remember, you know, when we talk about Mawadda and Law, it's not only commemorating the tragedies, also celebrating the events of happiness of the Ahlul Bayt. So inshallah we'll see you even tomorrow night. Salawat Banaikbara. Tonight the Majlis is for the Shahadat of our 11th Imam, Imam Hassan al Askari alayhi salatu wa salam. Very briefly, you know, Imam was born in Medina in the year 232 of the Hijrah. And his shahadat and wafat happened in Samarra. He was 28 years old. And during that time, the last six years was the 
period of his imamat. So his imamat era was very short, but very crucial because this comes just at the um, before the beginning of the occultation and the ghibat of the imam uh, of the present time. And just to look at the, you know, the situation at, at that time, the, the challenges that the 11th Imam and even the 10th Imam went through. How did they end up in Samarra? It was during the days of the 10th Imam that one of the Khulafa of Banu Abbas by the name of Mutawakkil, he was known to be a person who was filled with hatred towards Ali and Ali Ali. He is considered to be somebody equivalent to Yazid. Banu in Banu Umayya, Mutawakkil would be in among Banu Abbas. And part of his uh, plan was basically to keep a watch on the most prominent figure of the Ahlul Bayt, so the Imams of our times. And this is where he asked his officers actually to force the 10th Imam, Imam Ali and naqi al-Hadi alayhi salatu wa salam to move him from Medina to Samarra. And he was not, you know, brought alone. His family was with him. Initially they were settled in Baghdad, but in Baghdad there was still you know, the population was very vast. This was the previous capital of uh, Banu Abbas. And the circle of scholars and even the Shias there would still find their own ways to reach to the 10th Imam. And therefore, you know, even their stay in Baghdad was made very short. And they were moved from Baghdad to Samarra, which was the new capital of Banu Abbas. And especially they were placed in an, es uh, in an area of the city which was actually a military camp. In, in Arabic you would call, you know, this is the place of Askar. Askar means army. This title given to the 11th Imam, Al-Askari, is because of that location. And that also shows that, you know, um, the... The, the place where they were allowed even to buy a house uh, was supposed to be in an, an area where the, uh, the army or the officers of Mutawakkil and his uh, uh, government would be able to keep a you know, close watch on the imam and his movements or th those who are coming to see him. And this is where we come to realize that you know, there was a lot of restrictions and suffocation as far as um, communication and meetings of the Imam uh, with the Shias. And this is the same time. So already 11th Imam, even before his Imamat, is in Samarra with his father. And this is the same era where you have Mutawakkil who expresses his hatred towards Ahlul Bayt by preventing the Shias from going for the ziyarat of Imam Sallallahu to the extent that he even tried to erase uh, any trace of the grave of Imam, Imam Salam. He was not successful in that, but that was the intent. What you see now in form of, you know, the ideology of the uh, Salafis and Wahhabis, that wherever they go, the very first important thing for them is to uh, destroy all the shrines and the graves of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or when ISIS was in control uh, in parts of Syria and Iraq for a short time. They even went actually for the shrines of the Anbiya uh, and the shrines which existed in Syria and Iraq area from a long, long time. And this is where we see that, you know, um, wherever we, we see this phenomenon of Wahhabism and Salafism, it can be traced back to Banu Umayyah during the days of Yazid, as well as the sentiments of people like Mutawakki. The irony is that, you know, and this is what I say, it's not really a, a Sunni issue, it's more a Wahhabi, a Salafi issue of destroying the shrines. Because these shrines of the uh, awliya and anbiya have been there for centuries. 
During the time of Banu Abbas, Banu Umayyah before that, when Muslims conquered, you know, Syria and Iraq, they didn't go around destroying the shrines of the prophets. And even when, when the uh, Uthmani family came to uh, power for centuries, they ruled the Middle East. And so this is where we see that this is actually a bid'ah. It's not establishing the sunnah of Rasulullah. This is, a, you know, innovation done by Salafis and Banu Umayyah. Of course, you know, uh, people like Mutawakkil are gone, but the shrine of Hussein is still there. Salawat Pranikbara. So the atmosphere for the Imam, whether it's the 10th Imam or, or the 11th Imam in Samarra was very, very much uh, precarious because of this, you know, restrictions put on them. More so because, remember, Banu Abbas are branch of Banu Hashim. There is a difference between Banu Umayyah, which is completely different. But when you look at Banu Abbas, they are part of the Banu Hashim. You know, there were three brothers, Abdullah, the father's, uh, the, the prophet's father, Abu Talib, Amir al-Mu'minin's father, and then Abbas. Abbas, they are all three brothers. Abbas is the ancestor of uh, Banu Abbas. Although Abbas had nothing to do with what the descendants did later on, but this shows they were all part of this uh, Banu Hashim clan. And, and, and this, is their, this is where we come to realize that they were very much familiar with some of the predictions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had made about his descendants. They were very, very well familiar with the idea of al-Mahdi. They also had you know, pretty good idea about the timing of the birth of the last Savior. And this is where you see this insistence on them to bring uh, the imams, the latter imams, closer to themselves. You know, whether it's in Kazimain you see in Baghdad, or you are talking about the situation in, in Samarra. So that they can keep an, uh, you know, an eye on them, just as Fir'aun, According to the information given, given to him by the scholars of the time, that, you know, the person who is going to destroy your kingdom is going to be born now. And you, we know what he did with Bani Israel at that time. Similar situation was there during the days of, of Mutawakkil and later on in Samarra. And this is where we see that, you know, uh, restrictions are there. Even the 11th Imam, during his short time of Imamat, there was an, a, a time where he was required to make his presence, you know, in the court of the minister or the khalifa once a week, just to make sure he's in town. Not only that, it was a way of even humiliating the, uh, the, the, the imam. And that was actually one of those days where those who wanted to see him or try to get close to him, or at least they can have a word with him, uh, would be on that day when he is supposed to go to the court of the uh, of the Khalifa or the minister of the time. And so the, the challenges were there. You know, we're talking about the era of, uh, um, you know, Ghaybat coming very uh, close now. And the problem was not only from outsiders. Unfortunately, they were even from insiders also. And we shouldn't be surprised. We're talking about Ismat is only for the Imam. They are Masoom. Doesn't mean that everyone else there is, is also Masoom. You know, one of the challenges that especially our 11th Imam faced was from his own brother. By the name of Ja'far bin Ali At-Taqi Al-Had. Ja'far is a younger brother of Imam Hassan Askari alayhi salatu wasalam. And he, the, he had this aspiration, you know, idea of becoming the leader of the Shias. And he knew he is not. He doesn't have any legitimacy on this issue of becoming an Imam. 
And yet he is trying. He gets closer to the Khalifa of the time. Mu'tamid uh, Billah, the Abbasid Khalifa of the 11th Imam's time, his Imamat. And he's trying to get support from them in order to project himself as the Imam of the Shia. There is one conversation very interesting which will, will show you the challenge that the Imam faced from inside as well as the greatness of the Imam preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day Jafar bin Ali al-Hadi goes to Mu'tamid Billah and he says, you know, why don't you declare and appoint me as the Imam of the Shias after my brother? So he knows it cannot be that, you know, Imam Hassan Asghar is to be replaced. He's saying, okay, let him be. But why doesn't the government make an announcement that I will be the next Imam? Even a Mu'tamid, an enemy like Mu'tamid Billah, realize this is a very outrageous, you know, a plan that he's talking about. And he put him down. Look at the words he says. He says, اعلم إن منزلة أخيك لم تكن بنا. He says to Jafar, you should know that the status of your brother is not because of us. We didn't make him the Imam. وإنما كانت بالله عز وجل. That the status that your brother Hassan al Askari has has, this is because of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Not that we made him, made him the Imam. وَكُنَّا نَشْتَهِدْ فِي حَتِّ مَنْزِلَتِهِ وَالْوَعْضُ مِنْهُ And we tried everything to bring his status down, to put him down. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ يَعْبَى إِلَّا أَنْ يَزِيدُهُ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ رِفْعَةً بِمَا كَانَ فِيهِ He says, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided that he is going to elevate the status of your brother every day. So even an enemy, you know, like Mu'tamid Billah realizes that this is not in our hand. You know, you're asking me to make you the Imam. He says, no, this, your brother has that status. It is elevated every day more by, the, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. بِمَا فِيهِ مِنَ السِّيَانَ وَحُسْنِ السَّمْتِ وَالْعِلْمِ وَالْعِبَادَةِ It's because of his purity in character. Because he is in the right direction, because of the knowledge that he has been blessed with, and because of his ibadat and the acts of worship that he does. Salawat. <laughs> of course, such people are going to be at the even more deeper trouble on the day of Qiyamah. If you know all this about him, why don't you just follow him? You know, he, he, he's talking about the status of the Imam which has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says further, he says to Ja'far, إِن كُنْتَ عِنْدَ الشِّيْعَةِ عَخِيكَ بِمَنْزِلَتِهِ فَلَا هَاجَةَ بِكَ إِلَيْنَا If you really have this potential and qualities and status in the eyes of the Shia community, then you don't need me. People don't, wouldn't accept you. وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيكَ مَا كَانَ فِي أَخِيكَ and if you don't have the qualities and the status that your brother has among the community, Lam يَغْنِ عَنْكَ فِي ذَلِكَ شيء, Nothing is going to help, help you in this plan that you have. Salawat <laughs> Pranayak And this is where we realize that, you know, you have problems from outside, then you have even problems from inside. Communication with the community was not easy during the days of the Imam. And of course, the community was prepared for it. Because you see from the days of the ninth Imam onwards. You know, when we talk about Niyabat and Vikalat of the Imam, this didn't only start with the Ghaybat al-Sughra. It started with the days of, actually even before that, but it became more organized, and vast, you know, the network of the representatives of the Imam was expanded during the 
ninth uh, Imam onwards, especially during the days of the tenth Imam, to the extent that you could have you can you can see the list of the uh, wakala and the representatives of the Imam all the way from you know um, Afghanistan and northern area of that Marv and Bukhara all the way to Egypt. Uh, and, and this is where you see the extent of the Shia community. Uh, maybe in, they, might, they were never in majority, but it seemed they were spread all over. And that, that is the network where that the 10th Imam you know, had. And 11th Imam also uh, basically inherited that uh, network. And that is how the Shias were already being trained gradually. That a time will come where you will not be able to meet your Imam directly, face to face. And this is how you will be able to communicate with the Imam through the Naibin, through the you know, representatives. And interestingly, the first special or the chief um, you know, representative of the Imam of our time, Ajalallah Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. is the one who had the vikalas from the 10th Imam. And that position was maintained by the 11th Imam, and he becomes naib awwal during the ghaybat al -Sughra. And so this is what I would like to say, that this whole system of niya niyabat and vikalat did not just emerge automatically during the ghaybat uh, al time. No, this was being, you know, the community was being prepared for, for that from earlier time. One of the means by which the 11th Imam was in communication with his uh, followers was, of course, through the letters. People would write letters to him, give to their uh, wakil, uh, if they are far away, to those wakala who are close by, they will send it to the chief wakil of that time, and he will somehow find a way to reach to the Imam. They were actually, um, one of them, uh, the, the first naib of the uh, 12th Imam, during the days of the 11th Imam, actually even changed his uh, profession. He started uh, selling um, oil in bigger, big, big containers, going door to door. You know, uh, those days you do not necessarily always go to the shops. You know, people come and bring things to the door. And the reason why he adopted that was because this would be an excuse for him to go to that alley or the street where Imam lived and he would be, you know, taking containers in. And apparently, you know, people will say, ah, this is the person who sells oil. But many of the containers would actually have, you know, letters from the Imam. And, and, and this is where um, you will see that when it comes to the sayings of our 11th Imam, in many cases, you will see so-and-so wrote a letter to the Imam, and this was the response that he received. Salawat from the Let me share with you one uh, letter which is relevant to a question, which is an ongoing issue for, you know, people in the community. And I get this, uh, you know, request to know more about it, uh, depending on the uh, situation that people fa face. And um, this is actually from Muhammad bin Hassan al-Saffar, one of the close companions of the Imam, where he says, I wrote to the Imam, asking about the ruling of a widow, a woman whose husband has passed away. And he wrote to him, في إمراة مات عنها زوجها وهي في عدة منه. عدة means the waiting period. There is a time where, you know, um, for example, the, the lady cannot remarry again until the idda is has ended. When the husband dies, the idda would be uh, four month, ten days. Unlike the idda for talaq and divorce, that is, Three months, and the rulings are completely different. There are many, many, you know, sisters who get confused when the divorce happens. 
And so the, the idda of wafat, as we call it, when a woman becomes a widow, you know, he is asking that she is in her idda, wa hiya muhtaj, muhtajatun, and she is in need, you know, to fulfill her requirements. Um, لا تجد من ينفق عليها There is no one who can provide for her. Therefore, she is forced to go out of the home where هي تعمل للناس And she works for others. So is it permissible for a widow to go out and work in order to earn for herself and her children, for example, uh, during the time when she is going through this idda of four months and ten days? هل يجوز لها أن تخرج وتعمل وتبيت عن منزلها للعمل ولهاجة في عدتها Is she allowed to go out of her home? You know, and go and work uh, in, in order to fulfill her uh, needs and requires, requirements. An imam responds to that very simply. The hadith says that imam wrote on that, uh, under that question, لا بأث بذلك إن شاء الله. There is no problem for her in this matter at all. And so this is where we have to realize that when we talk about the issue of uh, the idda of a widow for a month and ten days, it doesn't mean that she has to be totally, you know, confined inside the home. What is forbidden for a widow is number one, not to use zinat. What is zinat? Cosmetics, you know, whether it is on the body or on the uh, selection of the clothing during the time of Idda. So no alcohol, no eyeliner, no perfume, no dyeing of the hair or other things, you know. So that's number one, Zenith. Number two, the prohibition for her would be that she, has, she should refrain from wearing jewelry which is commonly used by her during special occasions. So if she has a ring which she wears, let's say, every day, that's not part of the hurmat and prohibition. We are talking about extra jewelry used during a wedding or viladat or other, you know, similar functions. And number three, even the clothing that she would wear at that time of idda should not be uh, the clothings in her society, which are considered to be, you know, the clothings of happy occasion. And this would change from one area to another, one culture to another, one time to another. You know, so these are all uh, cultural issues there. And finally, it is makru for her to leave the house without a necessity. And so in case of this lady, where Hassan al-Safar asked this question from the 11th Imam, he said she needs to go out and work in order to sustain herself and her children. It was out of necessity. And in that sense, you know, it wasn't a social visit or anything like that. And so there was absolutely no problem for her even to go to work during the time of uh, Idda. Of course, it is makru for her to spend the night uh, other than uh, her own house. Uh, and so, you know, this is something I thought maybe I'll share with you in general. One of the issues I get these days, it's becoming common and there is no problem in, in that, that some of the family members, the children, sometimes feel that maybe if the mother is going through this uh, a stage of mourning and grief, they would like to take her to Ziyarat, for example. So is the Ziyarat trip you know, permissible at that time or not. Well, that is not a social visit. It is not really going to a marriage, you know, ceremony or something like that. So that shouldn't be, the ziyarat uh, trip would not be an issue even during the time of Idda for a, uh, uh, for a widow. Salawat Salawat Another example from the life of the Imam, just to show the, the protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the status of the Ahlul Bayt. In spite of all these opposition, you know, of course, the example of Amir al-Mu'minin is the most outstanding one. 
means you have banu umayya using abusive language about him in every friday khutbah for almost half a century so you know generations have grown up hearing bad things about amir al-mu'minin yet if you look at the ahadith in the books of ahl sunnah wal jamaah ahadith of the prophet praising amir al-mu'minin according to ahmad bin hanbal and others they say that the narration that we have in the praise of the three khulafa, khulafa put together this is the ahadith which are there survived in the books are more in number uh, for amir al-mu'minin than compared to those of the three khulafa so in spite of all this opposition allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has maintained the the greatness of the ahlul bayt and this is what we also see when it comes to the example of our 10th and 11th imam let me uh, share with you one example from a christian family of samarra salawat par dekh mara this is samarra is in the northern part uh, from from baghdad the shia area the present uh, iraqi uh, situation the way it is baghdad and south is all all the way to basra this is the shia area north you go is the kurdish area in between and this is mostly a sunni area samarra happens to be in the sunni area and that's why the I- daesh has first you know target for them on all these campaign that they had was samarra then they would reach to Kazimain and then go to Karbala and the Najaf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eliminated their problem. Alhamdulillah, you know, during our own time. But, but there you will also see that there is a, a minority Christian community even now. Although because of ISIS, their number has decreased because of their, you know, migration outside Iraq. They have moved away. Uh, but they have been there for a long, long time. And even if you, for example, when you hear the, um, the caravan of Imam Hussain al-Islam taken from Kufa to Damascus, there are points where they stop close to the monasteries of the Christian monks. And these, these places, some of them have survived even now. And so, you know, presence of uh, Christian individuals in Samarra and those areas those days is not really you know, uh, uh, out of the norm. And so there was a person by the name of Anush al-Nasrani. He was actually one of the senior administrators of um, Mu'tamid Billah's administration, the government. And he actually, um, he had two sons who were not feeling well. And he wanted the imam to come and visit him, his home. and pray for the shafa of the two sons but he didn't find in himself the uh, the courage to approach the imam directly so he asked the um, the khalifa mu'tamid um, that if if you can request him you know to fulfill my uh, plea on this issue and so imam sent a messenger he said you know um, There is a request by our administrator by the name of Anush. You know, so we will be taking you with honor and, and respect to his house. Um, why? Because the messenger told the imam that Anush and Nasrani had told the khalifa that I would like him to come and do the dua for my sons. Why? نحن نتبرك بدعاء بقاء النبوة والرسالة because we have a tradition among ourselves in their you know Christian community that the dua of those who are the descendants of the Anbiya and the Rasul is more acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and since Imam Hassan Askari was one of the descendants Of the uh, last Nabi, he said, I wanted him to come and do the dua. 
When Imam heard this, he said, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ja'ala al-nasarani a'rafu bihaqqina min al-muslimin. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has given the insight to this Christian to know our status more than this Muslim. Salawat wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Since he was a, you know, prominent person in the government, you know, uh, even the Christian uh, priests were, had gathered in his house at the time when Imam was supposed to come. And so Imam was taken with, uh, you know, on honor by the uh, government officials. As soon as he realized that the Imam has reached the door, he came out of his house without any, you know, hat or anything, and uh, barefooted as a way of, you know, exp expressing his uh, uh, humility against the Imam. And the, the priests were all in their uniform with him. And he was carrying this Bible, you know, hanging it. Like, you know, sometimes we have people put it on this uh, chain. Or if not on themselves, they have it in their car. You know, for barakah. And um, he met the Imam and he says, Ya Sayyidina, أَتَوَصَّلُ إِلَيْكَ بِهَادَ الْكِتَابِ الَّذِي أَنْتَ عَارَفَ بِهِ مِنَّا That I, you know, I am uh, pleading, pleading, pleading to you in the name of this book, referring to the Injil that he was hanging on his neck there. And you know more about this than us, about this book. I ask you that to forgive me for giving you this trouble to come to my house. He says, in the name of the Messiah, Isa ibn Maryam, and whatever has come in the Injil, I actually ask the Khalifa, why? Because Because when I study the Injil, I have found you in this book to be like Isa in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this Christian is looking at the Imam, you know, as a somebody similar to Isa ibn Maryam. And Imam said, Alhamdulillah. And then Imam told him that as far as your, you know, request for me to do the dua, Imam said, I actually give you the news. Ibn Kahada Fabaqin Ali. He points to one of the sons. He says he will be there. He will he will survive and get well. The other son will be taken away. Means he will die after three days. And this son of yours is going to survive. You know, he will become healthier. And when he grows up, he will become Muslim. And his Islam would be good. And he will be from those who is devoted to the Ahlul Bayt. Salawat Akbar. Of course, you know, people will say, how, how did he know? Well, this whole discussion about Ilm al -Ghayr. And that is the reason why even those who do not, you know, who, who, those who are enemies or those who do not even believe in them still would seek their du'as. They know that they have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Anush and Nasrani there, he says, if this is what you say, I accept it. I accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding my son. That one will survive, the one Allah will take him back. And I will not complain. Because you have said that. And this is where the Christian priests who were with him kind of got annoyed. And they said, you malaka la taslib. They said to Anush, their host, if this is the case, the way you are interacting with this person, why don't you become a Muslim? 
And this is where we come to realize that there are some people who still maintain taqiyya. Apparently he was Christian, but he says now, أنا مسلم ومولانا يعلم ضالي I am a Muslim and my master knows about Salawat An Imam said that knowing the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I didn't want to go against it and that's why I didn't pray for your other son and this is where Anush says, لا أريد يا سيدي إلا ما تريد I submit yes, myself to you. If that is what you are saying, I agree with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, in the ziyarat uh, waris, we always say to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, Silmi qalbi li qalbikum sil. Then my heart submits to your heart. It is in these moments that the imtahan comes in. Not only, you know, what we want to do, or we, we, you know, haram and halal. When we are put into test and trial, that's where we have to see whether we submit to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. The narrator of this event, Abu Ja'far Ahmad al-Qasir al-Basari, he says that indeed after three days, one of his sons died. The others survived after a few years. We had seen him. He became a Muslim. He was a Shia. And he was with us during the wafat of Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salatu wassalam. Salawat. And so, yes, it was a very precarious situation. You know, communication with the Imam was not that easy. But we still see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about situations that the greatness of the Imam would still be reflected even public. And although his Imamat was only for six years. But let me conclude with uh, one more incident to show you the, the challenges that our 11th Imam went through, especially in preparing the community for uh, the Ghaybat era. The mother of Imam Hassan Askari al-Islam, known as uh, Susan or Sousan, or other name for her was um, um, Hudays or Salil. These are different names given for the mother of the Imam. And um, so the mother of Imam Hassan Askari Salam becomes the grandmother of our present Imam Hazrat Mahdi Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farju Sharif. So our, our Imam's grandmother, you know, Arabic you call it Al Jadda, you know, the grandmother. Because she was the grandmother of our present Imam, the community at that time used to actually refer to 11th Imam's mother as Jadda. So she became in a way grandmother for the whole community. Sheikh Saduq has a very interesting narration which shows, uh, you know, even the role of the women in continuing this process of spreading the words of the Imam to the community. He says, and this is a narration from Sheikh Saduq, um, talking about Ahmed bin Ibrahim. He says, I went to the house of the Imam in the year 262. This is Ghaybat al-Sughra time already. This is the, after the wafat of the uh, Imam. Um, in Samarra, and I talked to Hakima. Hakima Khatun is the aunt of the 11th Imam. And she was behind the curtain. I was on this side of the cur curtain. And I asked her religious questions. And she responded to my religious questions. So this is an important point. That even the women of the, of the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, who were close to the Imam. During that Ghaybat al-Sughra. Were also source of guidance for the, uh, for the community. In his question, he asked uh, her, Hakim Khatun, he asked her about the location of the present Imam, who was very young at that time. And he said, where is the child? 
and she said mastur mastur means he is in um occultation he is in concealment you cannot see him and so ahmed bin ibrahim now is asking hakima khatun that if we have issues and you and you not a, are not available where do you refer to and this is where hakima khatun says you know ila al jadda umm abi muhammad refer to the grandmother of the community the uh, mother of imam hasan askari alayhi salatu wassalam ahmed bin ibrahim was a learned person and for him this was a very unusual situation that you know we are being referred to a lady and so he says that imam hasan askari is the one who actually arranged all this process you know what was the precedence for him to say that people can can also refer to his mother the grandmother of the community and this is where hakima khatun responds by saying iqtada'an bil husain bin ali that you don't have to go that far what you see now is very similar to the example of husain bin ali the imam husain alayhi salam appointed zainab to be there you know to shield imam zainul abidin alayhi salam many things would be uttered by zainab which were actually from the fourth imam but it will be declared to the public in the name of zainab bint ali salawatullah alayhi salawat आज की ये वफात की मजलिस ग्यारहवें इमाम के वफात के सिलसिले में है और मुहरम सफ़र के ये अयाम अज़ा की एक लिहाज से आखिरी कड़ी है हम लोग जमा हुए हैं उस इमाम को पुरसा देने के लिए कि जो पाँच साल इमाम आसर उस वक्त जो है यतीम हुए हैं जब जब सिर्फ पाँच साल के थे और ये आसान मरहला नहीं था इमाम के लिए लेकिन साथ साथ हमें पुरसा देना है जनाब अलिया को भी जो ग्यारहवें इमाम की सिस्टर थी जनाब हकीमा को भी को भी जो दसवें इमाम की सिस्टर मौजूद थी वहाँ और यहाँ हमें जनाब मासूम कौम को भी याद करना है इसलिए कि ये सब बहने हैं जो अपने भाइयों के मोहब्बत में उनके साथ साथ आए हैं और यकीनन हमारे लिए भाई बहन के जब रिश्ते की बात होती है सबसे पहला नाम जहनब बिन तहली का है इमाम असर से सिर्फ हम इतना कहेंगे कि आपके बाबा को जहर दिया गया था मोतमद के ज़माने में और उस जहर के असर में इमाम की तबीयत ख़राब हुई और उस वक्त जो है इमाम अपने घर में थे सामरना में जो रोज़ा है ये कब्रिस्तान नहीं था ये इमाम अली नकी आसलाम का घर था पर्सनल हाउस था जिसमें वो दफन हुए थे पहले और उसके बाद इमाम हसन अस्करी दफन हुए और उसके बाद वहीं पे जनाब हकीम खातून और जनाब नर्जिस की भी कब्र है वहाँ पर तो वहाँ सिर्फ एक खबर नहीं है सामरम में जब हम लोग जाते हैं और उसी घर में इमाम की वफात वाक़ होती है शीयों का अकीदा है कि इमाम का जनाजा इमाम ही मासूम का जनाजा मासूम ही पढ़ सकता घर में गसल दिया गया कफन पहनाया गया पब्लिक फ्यूनरल से पहले नमाज जनाजा घर के अंदर हुई बनो हाशिम के अफरान सब जमा हुए और जाफर जो भाई थे इमाम के वो आगे आते हैं नमाज जनाजा के लीड करने के लिए लेकिन उसी वक्त पर्दा खुलता है और हमारे कमसन इमाम आते हैं चचा को हटाते हैं उस जगह से कहते हैं ये आपकी जगह नहीं है ये मेरी जगह है और इमाम ने नमाज जनाजा पढ़ाए 
اور اس کے بعد امام حسن عسکری علیہ السلام کے جنازہ اٹھتا ہے شہر میں اعلان ہوا تھا کہ یہ پبلک مارننگ کی ہالی ڈے ہے بازار کو بند کر دیا گیا تھا اور امام کا جنازہ جو ہے اشتہام میں بہت بڑی تعداد میں لوگ جمع ہوئے تھے مین جو میدان تھا شہر کا سینٹرل جو ایریا تھا وہاں لایا گیا اور پوری پبلک وہاں جمع تھی نماز جنازے کے لیے محتمد کے بھائی نے آ کے نماز جنازہ پڑھائی ہے پبلکلی اور پھر دوبارہ یہ جنازہ جو ہے احترام کے ساتھ اٹھایا گیا گھر میں لایا جاتا ہے دفن کر دیا جاتا ہے امام اثر کی خدمت میں صرف اتنا کہیں گے کہ مولا آپ کے بابا کو زہر دیا گیا تھا لیکن جنازہ بڑی شان اور شوکت کے ساتھ اٹھایا گیا تھا مجھے تو وہ بیٹا یاد آتا ہے کہ جو دور نہیں تھا بابا سے مجھے تو وہ بہن یاد آتی ہیں جو اتنا دور نہیں تھی مجھے تو وہ بیٹی یاد آتی ہے وہ زوجہ یاد آتی ہے کہ جو حسین کے لاش سے دور نہیں تھی لیکن قریب نہیں پہنچ سکے مولا کے خدمت میں پرسے کے طور پہ صرف اتنا کہیں گے مولا آپ نے نماز جنازہ پڑھائی ہے لیکن امام سید سجاد کو آپ دیکھ لیں کہ جب یہ قافلہ چلا ہے کربلا سے امام سجاد کی جو کیفیت تھی آپ سنتے رہتے ہیں کہ وہ حالت تھی کہ زینب کی نظر جب چہرے پر جاتی ہے کہتی ہے بیٹا یہ تمہاری کیا کیفیت ہو رہی ہے یہ نہ ہو کہ تمہاری روح جو ہے جسم سے جدا ہو جائے اس وقت امام سجاد نے یہی کہا تھا اب پھوپی ہم زندہ اور جوان ہے لیکن بابا کا لاشا بے گور و کفن ہم چھوڑ کے جا رہے ہیں ازداران حسین آج جناب نرجس خاتون کی خدمت میں پرسی کے لیے ایک بی بی کا ذکر ہم کرنا چاہیں گے کہ بی بی آپ موجود ہیں آپ کے بیٹے نے نماز جنازہ پڑھائی ہے گھر کے اندر جنازہ دفن ہوا ہے احترام کے ساتھ باہر بھی بڑے احترام کے ساتھ لیکن کربلا کی ایک خاتون تھی ایک جن کا ایک ششماہ بچہ جو ہے ایک کربلا میں چھوٹ جاتا ہے شوہر کی شہادت بھی کربلا میں ہوتی ہے ایک بچی دی چار سال کی جو رباب ہمیشہ اپنے شوہر کی یاد کے طور پہ اسے دیکھتی تھی لیکن وہ بیٹی بھی زندان شام میں دفن ہو جاتی ہے ازداران حسین یہ قافلہ جب مدینہ پہنچا ہے یقیناً ہر بی بی کے لیے وطن لوٹ کے آنا اچھی بات تھی لیکن رباب وطن آ کے کیا کرتی ان کے شوہر اور بیٹے کا لاشا کربلا میں دفن تھا بیٹی شام کے زندان میں دفن ہے دو سال صرف زندہ رہی لیکن کسی دن بھی دن کے وقت جو ہے سائے میں نہیں بیٹھتی تھی جب بی بی آ کے سمجھاتی تھی رباب یہی کہتی تھی میرے مولا کا لاشا بے گور و کفن کر بلا میں پڑا رہا قبول فرما ہمارے گناہ کو بخش دے ہمارے توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما خدا وندہ عالم اسلام میں صلاح اور امن کی فضا پیدا کر امام کی ظہور میں تاجل فرما ربنا تقبل من کنت سمیون علیم ماتم حسین